All right, so we've seen a couple examples of randomized algorithms and how they can be very simple and very efficient. Um, but where does randomness really come from in a computer? Right? In most programming languages, there's some function called something like rand, which gives you a random bit or a random integer or a random floating point number between 0 and 1. But where does it get its randomness from? Uh, in principle, it could be getting its randomness from an actual physical source of randomness in the environment, like thermal noise or some quantum effect. Um, and there are, in fact, sources of random noise in the environment, according to modern physics. Um, and there are also processors that try and take advantage of those to generate random numbers. But for the most part, that technology hasn't really come to sort of full mature fruition where you can really rely on it. Um, and the ones that are more reliable are not usually available in your laptop computer. So where does this actually come from? Usually what this comes from is what's called a pseudo-random generator. And it's called pseudo-random because it's not actually random. It's actually a deterministic function. So a pseudo-random generator is a deterministic algorithm which takes in what's called a seed. And starting from that seed, it generates a deterministic sequence of numbers that if you didn't know the seed, the sequence of numbers looks random. The goal is for it to look random enough to fool any algorithm that's using this pseudorandom generator essentially into thinking that it's getting truly random numbers. Where does the seed come from? Because now you want the seed to be random. Well, again, the seed might come from thermal noise. Oftentimes it comes from you know, the last few digits of the internal clock of your computer, which if you sample them at any given time are relatively random because the clock is constantly flipping through those digits. Um, but the seed comes from somewhere. But now you just need a very small seed as your source of randomness, and then you have a deterministic algorithm that generates the rest of the randomness. So this is how it actually works in practice. Um, in theory, you could ask, OK, is this legitimate? Do we really need randomness? Or can we actually get away with pseudorandom generators all the time? Uh, the conjecture, which is widely believed, but let's say not quite as widely believed as p not equal np, um, is that, in fact, you don't need randomness for most tasks in a computer. That um, if your algorithm is outputting a deterministic function, like sorting, for example, or if it's uh, deciding something deterministic about its input, even if it uses randomness to do it, that actually you don't need that randomness, that that randomness can essentially always be substituted by a pseudorandom generator. Um, there is a complexity class associated with this. So BPP is the name of the uh, class of problems that can be solved in polynomial time uh, by a randomized algorithm. And the conjecture is that BPP equals P. So anything that can be decided efficiently with randomness can actually also be decided efficiently without randomness. Part of the reason people believe this conjecture is because of what's called the hardness versus randomness principle. And I say principle because there's sort of a class of results that come under this, but they are real results. There are real theorems that follow uh, along this general line. And essentially what the hardness versus randomness principle says is, if there exist functions that are actually sufficiently hard to compute, I can use those to essentially create good pseudo-random generators. Right? Or sometimes people say, de-randomize a randomized algorithm. Uh, and in particular, if sufficiently hard functions actually do exist, then this conjecture is true. So this is one of the reasons we believe this conjecture, because we believe that sufficiently hard functions exist. And let me just, I'm not going to give you the proof of this, it's highly technical, but let me just give you some intuition for why this principle might be true. The basic idea is you take your hard function, so we're supposing that some very hard function exists, um, you scale it down, right? And you scale it down so it's like if you have a hard function, say, that takes exponential time to compute, but you look at it on inputs of size log n, well, exponential in log n is now polynomial. Right? So now, on very small inputs, I can actually compute the hard function. And I use those inputs in my pseudorandom generator. Not quite as small as log n, because you don't want to be able to solve the hard function in polynomial time, but slightly above that, so that you can still uh, look at it efficiently. But the idea is, if a function could 
uh, realized that it was seeing a pseudorandom generator instead of random bits, which is sometimes called breaking the pseudorandom generator. If a function could break the pseudorandom generator that was created based on this hard function, then that would actually say that this function would actually make that hard function easy, which is a contradiction because we assumed the hard function was originally hard. Okay. The actual proof involves some very clever constructions and a lot more theorems behind it, but that's the rough intuition. And basically what this means is that what we do in practice, which is on your laptop when you use a randomized algorithm, you're actually using a deterministic pseudorandom generator, is more or less okay as long as the pseudorandom generator is good enough, right? Because even if the hardness versus randomness principle is true, even if there are sufficiently hard functions, even if this conjecture is true, that doesn't mean that your pseudorandom generator is good. It means there is some pseudorandom generator that's good enough. Um, but it's still sort of some theory backing up, like, yes, what we're doing in computers is okay, but you have to be careful. There have been cases where, because of quirks in certain pseudorandom generators that were used, it led people to believe that there was a pattern in their data that wasn't actually there, because the pattern was actually coming out of the pseudorandom generator rather than out of their data. So you do have to be a little bit careful when you're using a pseudorandom generator, and you should be aware that essentially whenever you're calling RAND, on most computers and most programming languages, you are using a deterministic pseudorandom generator. So if something smells a little fishy, you might want to check the pseudorandom generator. Um, but generally speaking, randomized algorithms have all of these benefits. They're simple to implement, they're simple to analyze, they're efficient, and even though we often don't have a source of true randomness in our computer, they are really okay to use.